We are still on Book 1, Canto 3, The Yoga of the Soul's Release. When we are learning all of the things that Sri Aurobindo is receiving from above and growing into the stature of the avatar. So, we'll begin with the line, this huge material universe became a small result of a stupendous force. Stupendous, of course, is in degree or excellent, marvelous for excellent, of astounding force. Now we have the line, overtaking the moment, the eternal ray illumined that which never yet was made. And so in discussing with Alok, Alok Pandey, he says it is the ray from the light of the Supreme that can show not only the depths hidden to our sight, but also the past and the future that is yet to be born. Thus it gives us a new significance and the true sense of all our experiences at a point of time. Madhav speaks about it a little differently. He says moment, so this is very important, overtaking the moment, the eternal ray, Moment is the sequence of time. Each moment records what is happening at that point. It relates to the present. The ray of the eternal interrupts the movement of time for a while and lights up things that are not yet manifest. Oh. It gives a peep into the future. The ray of the eternal is able to do it because the future is already present in the vision of the eternal. So we see that the eternal ray illumined that, and he capitalizes the T, that which never yet was made. Thought lay down in a mighty voicelessness. The toiling thinker widened and grew still. Now note that he capitalizes thinker here. The thinker is Ashwapati or Sri Aurobindo himself. And then he goes on to tell us, wisdom transcendent touched his quivering heart. Ashwapati, Sri Aurobindo. His soul could sail beyond thought's luminous bar. Mind screened no more the shoreless infinite. The mind, for us, which is a thing of ignorance, until we raise ourselves into the spiritual planes of consciousness. So usually the mind screens the infinite. We see things very, very compressed. You know, I have a meeting today, I have to do this tonight, I have to have my meal. It, you see, the mind is, is concerned with these very small things. So it screened no more the shoreless infinite because there's the infinite has no shore. It's extraordinary. We, we really don't understand well enough the infinite. So we'll continue on. Across a void retreating sky he glimpsed through a last glimmer and drift 
of vanishing stars, the superconscient realms of motionless peace, where judgment ceases and the word is mute and the unconceived lies pathless and alone. So we have to go through a little bit of this. So, First of all, the sky is retreating because it's an empty sky. It's a vast emptiness. But Ashwapati glimpsed through a last glimmer and drift of vanishing stars, the superconscient realms of motionless peace. So this word glimmer, of course, we know it's a dim or intermittent flicker or flash of light. And then we have this word, this drift of stars. It's, it's a kind of movement of stars, leisurely moving from place to place, seemingly without purpose. These superconscient realms of motionless peace, very, very few have been there. Most of the great sages have gone into the spiritual planes of consciousness and usually rest there in the intuitive or the overmind. Very few, with the exception of Sri Aurobindo and Mother, have reached the superconscient realms. And there's a motionless peace, absolutely motionless. And judgment ceases there. And even the word is mute. We've talked a lot about the word. But here the word is mute. It's not even a creative force. This is the transcendent. And unconceived. Unconceived is beyond thought, unimagined. Lies pathless and alone. Now, Sri Aurobindo capitalizes the unconceived because it's it's so important here, you see. It's not even brought into being. It's not even properly formed or developed. And Sri Aurobindo uses this word as a noun. There came not form or any mounting voice. He's continuing to tell us about this absolute silence in the superconscient realms. There only was silence and the absolute. Now, full stop. Out of that silence, mind newborn arose and woke to truths once inexpressible. So, yes. Out of that stillness. Yes. Uh, that oh, sorry. Out of that stillness, mind newborn arose and woke to truths once inexpressible. The mind is as if newborn when it enters the spiritual realms of consciousness. And we've been through that before, but let's just go through it once again. The higher mind is like a vast open sky when one can see so much. The illumined mind is a kind of flash of light, not too strong, but we can see things very clearly. The intuitive mind is where the things themselves are illumined and we can see them in their full illumination. And of course the overmind is the plane through which the supermind sends down creation. 
Out of that stillness, mind newborn arose and woke to truths once inexpressible. And forms appeared, dumbly significant, a seeing thought, look at that, a seeing thought, a thought that can see, that has vision, a self-revealing voice. And now, Sri Aurobindo is going to tell us, he knew the source from which his spirit came. And now we see that movement was married to the immobile vast. And now these two great lines. He plunged his roots into the infinite. He based his life upon eternity. Note that there is a brief space here between these two sections. And I always ask people, just take a moment to reflect upon, you can sit here if you want, Ashwarya. So he has based his life upon eternity and plunged his roots into the infinite. But after that little break, we see something else. Only a while at first, these heavenly estates, these large, wide-poised upliftings could endure. The high and luminous tension breaks too soon. The body's stone stillness and the life's hushed trance, the breathless might and calm of silent mind. So we see that even for Sri Aurobindo, these heavenly estates could only last a little while until he grew larger and larger in his consciousness. And so this luminous tension, this high tension, breaks off too soon. And one has to increase one's wideness, so we can say. And he's going to continue now. He's going to tell us that the body's stone stillness, and we see that in many yogis, when they go into samadhi, the body is absolutely stone still. There's no movement at all. That's when they stop the heart. And then they can bring it back after a minute or two or whatever. So this body stone stillness and the life's hushed trance, the breathless might and calm of silent mind. So even that is... I don't want to say disappearing, but there he cannot hold them for long. And then he says, or slowly they fail as sets a golden day. Why is this happening, we ask? The restless nether members tire of peace. And this is where we get the answer. And that the nether members are body, life, and mind. And therefore, he's going to tell us after that semicolon, a nostalgia of old little works and joys, a need to call back small familiar selves, to tread the accustomed and inferior way, the need to rest in a natural pose of fall. And then he gives us this marvel marvelous example. As a child who learns to walk can walk not long, 
And all of these things replace the Titan will forever to climb. And the Titan will here just means the, it's not the Titan. It's not capitalized. It just means something of prodigious size and strength. That Titan will that forever wants to climb is replaced by these different things, this natural pose of fall or like a child who learns to walk. And then he says, on the heart's altar, dim the sacred fire. What happens next? And it's going to rep- it's going to apply to all of us. An old pull of subconscious cords renews. That old pull of subconscious cords we all know. Our family, our youth, our work, our love affairs, all of these things are old pulls of subconscious cords that renew. And that's what pulls us down. And it draws the unwilling spirit from the heights. And then he gives us another example. Or a dull gravitation drags us down to the blind, driven inertia of our base. And our base is matter. That's where we've come from. But now he's going to give us some hope. This too, the supreme diplomat can use. Here, the supreme diplomat is the divine. And he can use all of this. Why? He makes our fall a means for greater rise. So, Arbind Basu once gave a talk. And he, it's, it's a line from Savitri. A God come down and greater by the fall. He spent an hour and a half talking about this. And I do have the journal of collaboration that has this, if anyone wants it. Incredible talk. Because he's telling us that when the divine comes down, he has to diminish himself to get into this human body. He's not changed anything, but his power is diminished. And so he is a God come down, and he's greater by that fall into the human body. And for into ignorant nature's gusty field, isn't that a powerful line? Ignorant nature's gusty field. We know what a wind, that's a gusty wind is. It's, it's just all over the place. Into the half-ordered chaos of mortal life, the formless power, the self of eternal light, follow in the shadow of the spirit's descent. He capitalizes the word power, he capitalizes the word self, he capitalizes nature, because he wants us to understand the, the essence of these words. We already know about nature and nature's constant breaking and rebuilding, always for the greater good. We know of this formless power, this self of eternal light, but we don't know yet that they follow in the shadow of the spirit's descent. Semicolon. The the twin duality forever one chooses its home mid the tumults of the sense. 
Wow. Tumult, violent and noisy commotion. And the twin duality, which is forever one, chooses its home mid the tumults of the sense. And then we're going to go into a passage that is so extraordinary. Uh, we'll go very slowly into it. He comes unseen into our darker parts and curtained by the darkness does his work. A subtle and all-knowing guest and guide till they too feel the need and will to change. So in the next canto, The Secret Knowledge, Sri Aurobindo will remind us again how the divine descends in us. He comes unseen into our darker parts and curtained by the darkness does his work. So he is in us right now, but the veils that are like curtains in front of us prevent us from seeing him. But he's a very subtle and all-knowing guest and guide. Till they too, these parts, feel the need and will to change. All here must learn to obey a higher law. Our body's cells must hold the immortal's flame. Now here is something that only Sri Aurobindo and Mother have given us. That the cells of our bodies must hold the immortal's flame. And I share with you Mother's words to Sat Prem, I believe. You know, Mother worked for 23 years after Sri Aurobindo left his body. She had nothing to do. She was fully realized already. The supermental was, had come down on earth. So what was she doing for 23 years? She was bringing the light into the cells of her body. And that's why when we were standing at the Samadhi, we would hear her scream so loudly. Because this was an extraordinary work. And science is even beginning to see that there is truth in this. They're not there yet, but they're going to find out. Now, our body cells must hold the immortal's flame. Mother told us, that she already had divinized many of the cells in her body and that any of us who was open to that could also receive those transformed cells. And that she told to Satpram. Now, if we didn't learn to obey this higher law, and our body cells hold the immortal's flame. What would happen? Else would the spirit reach alone its source, leaving a half-saved world to its dubious fate. Now, we see here that the Advaitist and the Buddhist say this world is illusion, get out of it. But Buddhism is not Buddha, because we are told also that as Buddha was merging into the divine, he turned around and looked with compassion on the earth. Wow. So, if we don't do that, the spirit would reach alone its source and it would leave a half-saved world to its dubious fate. 
And this is where Sri Aurobindo and Mother come in as the avatars of the present and future. Because Sri Aurobindo tells us this world was created for bliss and for love. And if we're going to leave this half-saved world to some dubious fate, then why did we come down at all? If we just want to escape into a nirvana and merge with the divine, which, you know, I, no, none of us here could criticize that, but Sri Aurobindo says, no, this earth has to become a life divine also. And that's why we see now with the supermental here, churning all of this mud and this filth and it's coming up and we see it all over. We've seen the cutting of the trees today. We've seen Israel, Hamas. We've seen Russia and Ukraine. All these things are going on now in the present, at this moment, people are killing each other. I'm told that in the early days, just maybe during even Vedic times, the Kshatriyas were the fighters, and they would and they would do battle with the opposing force. But at night, they would have dinner together. <laughs> And in the morning, the fight would continue. We don't hear about that anymore. Okay. So, nature would ever labor unredeemed. Our earth would ever spin unhelped in space. And this immense creation's purpose fail. Till at last, the frustrate universe sank undone. And I just want to go a little bit more because it's so important. Huh? Even his godlike strength to rise must fall. So Ashrapati has not yet reached the epitome of his evolution. The work of his transformation into a seer is not yet complete. We can also liken this to our journey. It's not yet complete. His greater consciousness withdrew behind. Dim and eclipsed, his human outside strove to feel again the old sublimities, bring the high saving touch, the ethereal flame, call back to its dire need, the divine force. Sri Aurobindo has a lot to tell us about the divine force and I'll just dwell a few minutes on that. He writes in his letters on yoga, two things. The divine force can act on any plane. It is not limited to the supramental force. The supramental is only one aspect of the power of the divine. This should move us, maybe shake us a little bit. The supramental is only one aspect of the power of the divine. And the second letter, that there is a divine force asleep or veiled by inconscience in matter and that the higher force has to descend and awaken it with the light and truth is a thing that is well known. It is at the very base of this yoga. When the peace is established, the higher or divine force from above 
can descend and work in us. But note this, the peace has to be established first. If we're constantly moved by dualities, events, angry words, all these things that we face each day, the divine force will not descend and work in us. The peace has to be established. Now he says something else. It descends usually first into the head and liberates the inner mind centers then into the heart center and liberates fully the psychic and emotional being, then into the navel and other vital centers and liberates the inner vital, then into the muladhara and below and liberates the inner physical being. It works at the same time for perfection as well as liberation. It takes up the whole nature, part by part, and deals with it, rejecting what has to be rejected, sublimating what has to be sublimated, creating what has to be created. And I will end there for this evening. So much more to come. Any questions? Yes, says it. I know you mentioned this before, but I want to ask it again. Can you just explain what is the difference between the infinite and the eternity? The infinite and the eternal? Yeah, because he plunged his roots into the infinite. Yeah. He based his life upon eternity. So what is the difference between eternity and infinite? I see the infinite as having no bounds at all. But I see eternity also having no bounds at all. And they're almost synonymous, therefore. I have yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes. That actually, yeah. Eternal would be the, to do with the time. Eternal has to do with the time. time. Yeah, forever. And infinite has to do with space. space. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They both have the same concept, but it is the space time. Yes, it's space time concept. Mm -hmm. And we live in a space time continuum, mm -hmm. unfortunately. We don't have that broadness of space, that limitlessness, mm -hmm. or that sense of time that's infinite. Thank you. Uh, so, what I could understand from this is that like when someone is kind of evolving in consciousness then there are some in the beginning there are some uh, incidences where like they are in communion in union with uh, probably the higher consciousness or super mind uh, but as it is kind of suggested in the text like it goes down, it goes back a little for some time and then it again comes back to, you know. Uh, yes, that is correct, but that is Ashwapati, not us. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so, so actually, <laughs> what we can say about us is that we may have some intimations, we may have some realizations, but these for us basically at our stage of life are examples of the grace, which is giving us this for our progress. And then it goes behind to work out what it has given to us. And then eventually we can go higher. Pavitra once wrote to me that uh, just be patient and more experiences will come. And you know how uh, Uma told us that story some weeks ago. Does anyone remember it? 
I think some of you weren't here. Would you share it with us about Tanmay? Tanmay yeah. and uh, and Pavitra? Yeah. So Pavitra and Tanmay, they both are very close. So once uh, <coughs> Pavitra left his body, he was missing him a lot. Tanmay is missing him very much. So he used to cry a lot and once he went to mother and asked her, um, like he, he misses Pavitra very much. But mother says, don't worry and uh, he is here, don't worry. But he is not satisfied, like he was very much, um, literally he was crying. So mother told, okay, wait, look at me. Then he was concentrating and saw mother's face. Mother's face turned into Pavitra. And then she said, see he is inside me. He didn't leave us, so be happy and easy. Thank you, Oma. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes. Uh, leaving a half-saved world to its dubious fate. That's where we are right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically <laughs> today. It's a half-saved world. Yeah, but but it's also essentially a divine world in progress. Yes, and and in that sense, I mean, could there ever be a dubious fate for something that comes from the divine? Yes, there can be, and we've had examples of Lemuria and Atlantis, who are far, far ahead of us technologically and even occultly, and their civilizations cratered completely, and Earth had to start again. Mother said there were six pralayas up to this time. She said this present Earth will not experience another pralaya because the supermental has come down. But she also says, truth or abyss, Charles? Yes, truth or the abyss, but that's the abyss. That's not going to sink the whole universe. It's it's going Just to have us. it. It's, huh? Just us. <laughs> well, that's possible because, yes, we could become like the dinosaurs. It's very true. Not we, but those who live in total inconscience, many who have just taken birth after being an animal, they've risen into the first birth. And that's why when mother was asked, how could 70,000 people all die in an earthquake in Peru? Weren't there psychic beings aware? And mother said to her, very few of us are aware of our psychic being. <laughs> Work in progress. Any others? Questions? Okay. <laughs>